Assalamu alaikum. Um, we are going to be discussing developmental coxohara. This is Dr. Amr Arf. Uh, our objectives for the lecture today uh, are uh, being able to know the types and natural history of coxohara, uh, to understand how the patient presents and their radiological characteristics, uh, to identify the aims and goals of treatment, and have a look at the different reconstructive procedures available. So what is coxavara? Coxavara is any decrease in the normal neck shaft angle. The normal angle is around 130 degrees. The decreased angle is called coxavara. Any increase in the angle is called coxa falca. Uh, we have to be able to identify some of the hip orientation measurements. Uh, the neck shaft angle is the angle between the anatomical axis of the femur, which is the line bisecting the diaphysis of the femur and the axis of the neck. It is normally around 130 degrees uh, in the normal pe persons. Uh, the medial proximal femoral angle is the angle between the anatomical axis of the femur again and the hip joint orientation line, which is the line from the center of the head to the tip of the greater trochanter, and the normal value is around 85 degrees. The lateral proximal femoral angle is the angle between the mechanical axis of the femur from the center of the head to the center of the knee and the hip joint orientation line. So how does the proximal femur normally develop? When we are born, the proximal end of the femur is wholly cartilaginous. Um, and at the age of four months, the ossific nucleus of the head starts to appear. Um, then this gradually increases. By four years, the ossific nucleus of the greater trochanter starts to appear. And at about six years, the whole physis, which was acting as one cartilaginous growing part, separates into two physeal areas, the physeal part of the head and the apophysis of the greater trochanter. At the end of growth, the whole bone becomes ossified and we end up with the remaining articular cartilage on the surface of the head of the femur. The forces that act on the growing uh, proximal femur uh, start to appear when the child starts to walk. So we have the body weight acting as a compressive force on the head, and we have the force of the abductor muscles that pull on the greater trochanter. This creates tensile forces in the trochanteric apophysis and compressive forces in the uh, physis of the head. The uh, normal growing cartilage responds to the tensile forces by increased growth and to the compressive forces by inhibition of growth. So there is a differential growth here between the trochanteric apophysis, which is enhanced, and the uh, physis of the head of the femur, which is a bit inhibited. This differential growth would result into shifting the shape of the proximal femur into more varus. That's why when we are born, we are born with an angle that is in the valgus range, 150 degrees. And as we grow up, and by the effects of the forces that are caused by walking, the angle gradually decreases until by the time we reach adulthood, it reaches the normal neck shaft angle of around 120 to 130 degrees. If a patient has coxavara, this causes some mechanical effects on the growing bone. Um, when the person stands, we have the compressive force of the uh, body weight, and we have the force of the abductor muscles. These abductor muscles, they pull from the, from the greater trochanter, but at the same time, they cause some compression at the center of the head itself. So the resultant compressive force from these two forces acts on the center of the head. Normally, the orientation of the head physis is perpendicular to the uh, resultant compressive force. So the forces acting on the whole physis are uniform, and the physis grows naturally in, uniform, uh, in a uniform pattern, causing elongation of the neck. But when coxavara starts to develop, uh, the orientation of the physis gradually becomes more vertical. It loses its, its perpendicular aspect with the acting compressive force that is the resultant force acting on the center of the head. This creates more compression on the medial part of the physis and more tension on the lateral part of the physis. Uh, this differential growth inhibits the growth on the medial and inferior side and increases the 
uh, coxa vara effect further. At the same time, this slanting of the physis creates more shear forces um, at the physeal line. And the shear forces tend to cause earlier ossification of the physis. So the natural history, the is for progression of the coxavara to occur due to the slanting of the physeal line, and um, that some degree of inhibition and arrest occurs, leading to a shorter neck. Um, regarding the effects of this coxavara position on the hip dynamics, um, normally the elevation of the greater trochanter above the center of the head due to the effect of the coxavara shortens the abductor muscles from the origin to the insertion so they become weaker at the same time this increases the lever arm of the abductors similarly the shorter neck in comparison to the longer neck decreases a bit the lever arm of the abductors and um, uh, eventually there is abductor weakness causing most of the symptoms that we will see uh, as we proceed what are the different types of coxavara? Um, we have the congenital coxavara. This is the type which is usually associated with a congenitally short femur or femoral deficiency. You will notice sclerosis here in the proximal femur. You will notice that the femur is shortened, that the limb is externally rotated, and uh, this uh, congenital short femur is usually uh, unilateral. Some cases it is bilateral, but it is usually unilateral. So this is the term congenital coxavara, and it shouldn't be mistaken with the developmental coxavara because the developmental coxavara is a distinct type that is not present at birth, but starts to appear at the age of four to five years. The hallmark for this type is the presence of the Fairbanks triangle, as we will see in a few moments. The other type is the dysplastic type, which is associated with a bone pathology. For example, the vitamin D-resistant rickets or hypophosphatemic rickets, the rachitic manifestations are apparent and there is coxavara, or for example, spondyloepiphyseal dysplasia, where there is affection of the epiphyses and a mushroom-shaped epiphysis on both sides in addition to the coxavara. Um, the spondylometaphyseal dysplasia with affection of the different metaphyses with irregularity and fraying and the vertebrae, as well as coxavara. The cleidocranial dysplasia, where there is bilateral coxavara in addition to an absent or deficient clavicles, allowing the patient to rotate the shoulders forward as we see in the picture. So the dysplastic coxavara is due to an underlying bone pathology. And the last type is the fibrous dysplasia uh, with the shepherd crook deformity of the proximal femur. The last type of coxavara is the acquired type. Uh, it is acquired after trauma, for example, a fracture of the neck of the femur that may heal in uh, a malunited position if it is not properly managed, um, or AVN due to Bertie's disease, or um, post-septic after neonatal sepsis uh, affecting the growth of the proximal femur. Uh, we are going to talk today mainly about developmental coxavara, and the radiological characteristics of developmental coxavara are a decreased neck shaft angle, obviously, in addition to a widening of the physis. And sometimes there is a characteristic metaphyseal triangle in this area called Fairbanks triangle, causing the physis to take the shape of an inverted Y. This triangle is pathognomonic of the developmental coxavara, but it is not always present, as we see in this other side where there is developmental coxavara as well, but the angle, but the triangle is not apparent. To measure the severity of the, of the coxavara, we measure it by the neck shaft angle by the position of the greater trochanter measured by the articular trochanteric distance, the distance from the uh, articular joint line to the tip of the greater trochanter, which normally should be positive, but it becomes decreased and sometimes even becomes negative. Uh, we have the head shaft angle, which is the angle between the axis of the femur and a line perpendicular to the uh, direction of the physis. And mostly we measure it by the helgen reiner epiphyseal angle. This is the uh, consensus angle that we measure for the severity um, between the helgen rhinon line passing through the tridoidid cartilage on both sides and the uh, obliquity of the physeal line starting from the proximal physis. So even if there is a Y-shaped physis, we 
draw this line along the proximal part of the physis. Does Cox Savara progress? It is according to the cause for the congenital uh, cases in the cases with AVN, it usually progresses. In the dysplastic cases, there is variable degrees of uh, progression. In traumatic cases, for example, a malunion, sometimes it may remodel. Regarding the developmental coxavara, the risk of progression is according to the severity, according to the orientation of the physial, uh, of, the, of the physis of the head of the femur. So if the Helgenreiner epiphyseal line is less than 45 degrees, it is normally, by the way, less than 25 degrees. If it is less than 45 degrees, it is unlikely to progress and there may be spontaneous improvement. If it is between 45 to 60, there is some degree of progression and close follow-up is important. If it is more than 60, as we see in most of the cases, it, there is a high risk of progression and it requires surgery. How does the patient present? The incidence is rare. Uh, equal in both sexes, 50% are bilateral. The patient presents at the age of four to five years. If it is unilateral, the patient presents with a painless limb or the patient or the parents notice some degree of limb length discrepancy. If it is bilateral, they present by waddling gait due to the abductor weakness. Also, the abductor weakness causes some aching at the glutei with excess walking. The signs we see is the Tremlenberg sign uh, where the weak abductors on the stance side cause the pelvis to fall on the swing side. There is limitation of the abduction due to the uh, impaction of the greater trochanter that is high against the ileum. There is also limited internal rotation because there is some degree of retroversion as well. Uh, we can palpate the position of the greater trochanter in relation to the iliac crest and we find that it is high. We will test for the femoral antiversion by the prone test that we all know and we will find that there is some degree of uh, retroversion or decreased antiversion than normal and we can do the block test for the uh, limb length discrepancy, which is usually not very severe in the developmental type. Uh, we have to check that there is no late DDH, and we have to check for other manifestations of skeletal dysplasia to make sure that it is the developmental type, not the dysplastic type. The problems we have when we think about management, we have the weak Trendlenburg, uh, weak abductors and the Trendlenburg sign, so we want to restore the greater trochanter position to a lower level below the center of the head of the femur. There is risk of progression and recurrence, so we want to correct the uh, physial uh, uh, obliquity and correct the uh, Hilgrai Brazil angle to less than 25. We want to manage the limb and discrepancy to manage the red retroversion by derotation, and if there is associated astabular dysplasia, we manage it by pelvic osteotomy. The surgeries that we do are to correct the neck shaft angle, we have the proximal femoral valgus osteotomy. The valgus osteotomy, the osteotomy here and bringing the distal segment into valgus will uh, correct the orientation of the uh, physial line. It will bring down the greater trochanter and lengthen and strengthen the abductors. And we can incorporate some internal rotation to correct the retroversion. Uh, if we aim to correct the abductor weakness, we can uh, increase the length of the abductors by transferring the greater trochanter distally or by doing epiphysiodesis of the greater trochanter with the different methods of epiphysiodesis. So when do we do the valgus osteotomy alone and when we combine it with the trochanteric distal transfer? If the difference in the neck shaft angle and the medial proximal femoral angle is the same as we see here, the difference from the normal value of the neck shaft angle and the medial proximal femoral angle is the same, 21 and 21 then the valgus osteotomy will be enough. Once we correct the neck shaft angle by the desired degree, the media proximal femoral angle uh, is corrected as well and the greater trochanter drops to its normal position. But if the difference in the neck shaft angle is less than the media proximal femoral angle, as we see here, there is a decrease in the neck shaft angle that is less than the decrease in the media proximal femoral angle from normal. If we do the valgus osteotomy and correct the neck shaft angle, the greater trochanter will still be elevated. If we do overcorrection of the neck shaft angle, the greater trochanter will drop to normal, but we will have coxa valva. So in this case, it is better to do the valgus osteotomy in association with the uh, uh, distal transfer. The different types of osteotomy have trochanteric or subtrochanteric. The subtrochanteric will relax the iliopsoas tendon the trochanteric will tighten the iliopsoas tendon and this will uh, be a factor if we have some degree of flexion deformity. 
the different types of osteotomy are the broad and transverse osteotomy, where we do a transverse osteotomy and um, bring the uh, proximal segment into varus and the distal segment into valgus to achieve the desired neck shaft angle. We make sure that the blade does not extend into the physis. Then we have the Powell's Y osteotomy, which is quite a complicated osteotomy. You can have a look at it by yourself. Um, the different methods of fixation are either wires. We insert the wires parallel to the upper margin of the neck. We do the osteotomy. We bend the wires to the desired neck shaft angle and we fix, fix them by circlage. We can use the blade plate. We can use a pediatric DHS, but usually in older uh, patients to be able to pass the physis and achieve proper um, fixation. Or we can do it by using a skeletal uh, external fixator. Um, and in this case, the osteotomy can be done even percutaneously. So the take home messages is that the development, developmental coxavar is a decrease in the neck shaft angle with trochanteric overgrowth. It presents by limp and Trendenberg sign due to weak abductors. There is some degree of limb discrepancy and retroversion. Fairbanks triangle is the characteristic radiological appearance. It is usually progressive if the uh, uh, Helgen Ryder Fizier angle is more than 45, the normal angle is less than 25, and the management is by a proximal vagus osteotomy with or without trochanteric transfer according to the case. Thank you.